again, I'm John DiBiase. Welcome to another edition of Disabilities Journal. My guest today is Eileen Minogue, Executive Director of Book Fairies. Welcome, Eileen. Thank you. Uh, I, I know for myself, uh, we, we met actually on a, at a, another meeting mm -hmm. one time, uh, but as I was moving uh, recently, I said, you know, what am I gonna do with all these books? And there were books that I enjoyed and I said, I know, I'm going to box them up and give them to book fairies and let somebody else enjoy the same books. Mm -hmm. So that's my experience with book fairies. And uh, you guys do a wonderful job. So go ahead. Tell us about book fairies. Thank you so much. Um, and you explain perfectly what we do is people have books on their shelves that they don't know what to do with. They don't want to throw them out. They, they enjoyed them and would like to upcycle them to someone who could do it. And we take them and we sort them for age and condition and we get them into the hands of people who will enjoy them. Uh, we were founded in 2012 by um, a mom from Belmore who heard about a teacher who was trying to raise money to um, fill her classroom. She didn't have enough books in her classroom that would be sufficient to teach the students that she was working with. And Amy said, I have books in my home. I can do that. And she collected over 3,000 books in that one wow. uh, yeah, one book drive. But what she learned was that the whole was bigger than that one teacher. Mm -hmm. um, here on Long Island, uh, actually it's across the country, um, you know, teachers are working with insufficient uh, it's tools to, to really make sure the kids learned how to, to read. And um, it's, uh, it's, an, it's a cycle of illiteracy that stems from poverty and it just keeps going on and access to books is one of the problems and one of the causes of illiteracy. So what Amy did uh, in 2012 is now um, over four million books distributed. Wow. Yep, uh, she started out in her van going around and picking the books up and now we have really kind of like a well-oiled machine. Our organization, um, we source books from a lot of different avenues. It could be someone like yourself. You want to get rid of, the, whether you're moving or you're just cleaning out, you want to get rid of your books. We take baby board books to adult books mm -hmm. that are in good condition. Um, if they were water damaged, if they're very yellowed, if they're not in a good condition where someone is going to want to really take them in, we don't take them. Okay. Um, but anything in between that that's in good condition, we will take them and then we source them. And so it could be you cleaning out your house. It could be kids doing a community book drive for community service. It could be corporations doing a drive within their, their system. And then we have remote drop sites where people can drop the books off if it's local to them in Suffolk. We have Habitat for Humanity Restore. We have Dairy Queen in Massapequa. We have, you know, um, a lot of different companies. They're all on our websites if you want to drop your books off there. Um, but once they come into our, our warehouse, we have a whole process and it's 99% run by volunteers who on their, you know, uh, they come in obviously because they're, they, it might be kids on their day off or, or volunteers that have retired and they come in and they source the books for aging condition. And what they do when they, when they look at the books, they say, is this book water damaged? Is it yellowed? Does it have a smell to it? Then those we recycle. We recycle okay. about 12 tons of books a year. So you just don't throw them away. You no, actually they don't. recycle them. That's great. Exactly. Uh, I know it's, it's actually a very painless process. I called, and I think I probably spoke with you, and um, I'm, I'm always an adventurer. I have to go and, and see things for myself. And I drove out, and um, I believe the girl's name was Christina. Mm -hmm. But it, it was just such an easy process. I have the books, in the, and they, I didn't even have to take them out of the trunk. Somebody came and took them from me. Um, and I felt good about it. I felt good that somebody else was going to have these books, that they're not going to be thrown away, they're not going to be burned, because um, I'm, anyway, mm -hmm. um, that it, it, they were going to be used. And I know my niece is a, is a uh, grammar school teacher, mm -hmm. and I know she always yaps about how, you know, she doesn't have enough stuff and she takes money out of her own pocket to, to supplement what, uh, what she needs to, to teach. And so having this, this available, how, how does somebody um, contact you and say, I've got books? 
So it's a really simple uh, process. We've uh, really created some really good infrastructure over the last couple of years to make it streamlined. <clears throat> and people can get almost any answer out of our, we our website which is thebookfairies.org or just bookfairies.org. Either way, it'll get you to our website. And um, they just go under donate and then donate books. And it tells you what our conditions, what we're looking for. Um, if they have more than five copy paper size boxes filled with books, we'll come pick them up from their house as long as it's, we'll go Long Island and into some of Queens, but we can't do the five boroughs for that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's really a very simple process, and um, it's all intuitive once you go into our website and they can tell you how to do that. Um, but like I was saying, if you know, once you do donate them, it does make you feel good because sure. they're getting into the hands. Number one, you're not throwing them in the garbage, right? So we we recycle twelve tons of books a year which is a lot, um, but books that come in that are, might be uh, well-loved but still have a story to tell, we have tried to give them out here in the Long Island tri-state area, you know, the metropolitan area, but the kids weren't really going for them. Could be uh, Curious George that's a little bit, you know, wrinkled, mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. um, Harry Potter that has a lot of dog ears or something like that. Um, we have a partner and we send them overseas to, um, Ghana, Nigeria, Zimbabwe. Okay. We help build libraries overseas with our partner, which is US Africa Children's Fellowship. And they have a container and they do all the shipping. So we source the books, we go through them, we hold them for them, and then they come pick them up every month or month and a half. That's amazing. Yeah. It's really great. Yeah. Um, when, I again, as, as we were cleaning out, uh, there were books that I said, oh, we don't need these books. and. Well, my wife would say, we don't need these books. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would go, well, no, we've got our granddaughter come. We've got another granddaughter on the way. Uh, so I said, you know, I, I like this. One of my favorite is Mow the Dog in Tropical Paradise. You know mm -hmm. the book? Mm -hmm. um, and I, so, so there's stuff that I wanted to hold back. And yet I said, okay, we can always get another copy of these. Okay, that's and that, I think that's another thing is that you, your kids have read these books and you said dog-eared and mm -hmm. well-read, not necessarily water damaged or, or mm -hmm. uh, anything, but well-read. Mm -hmm. And uh, you say, okay, I can get another copy. Yeah. So you donate your copy, and so it it's almost a uh, not just donating the copy, but it's almost like giving you a part of yourself, especially a book that you really enjoyed. One of my favorite books was Trinity, Growing Up, mm -hmm. Leon Urus. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, it's, a, it's about the uh, lead up to the 1916 rebellion for the folks who have no idea who, what Trinity <laughs> is about or Leon Urus. Uh, and it's about Ireland. And I really enjoyed it. I was thinking of uh, my ancestors in, uh, in Leitrim. And I said, okay, do I really want to give this up? And I think in the end I didn't. I think in the end I kept it. So, so you can do that as well. Uh, but, but passing a book on, it's really more passing it on than just giving it up. It's upcycling it. It's giving it new life and new mm -hmm. breath. And it's giving a, someone who does not have the opportunity or the access that maybe you might have to have the access. And that's really why we exist is because there isn't equitable access to books. Uh, we have school districts that are a mile apart from each other. One is overflowing with books, and the other one doesn't have enough books in it. Uh, it is not uncommon for some of the school districts or schools that we work with to not have a library that is functional. And I'm talking about here our neighbors. I'm talking about our, you know, Long Island. We service anywhere from the Hamptons to the Bronx. And uh, I have one teacher that comes in on her days off, including the summers. And um, she's constantly, she works and she volunteers with us. And then she'll pull books that work for her in her school. Her, her school library, the budget was cut and it was closed. So the kids, what's happening is the kids don't have, many of the kids that get our books don't have books in their home because the parents are choosing between food or rent or a book. You know, I know for myself, I have discretionary funding and I choose what I use to do with that funding. But if you don't have discretionary funding, you're, you're paying for the necessities of life. Mm -hmm. And um, 
for these families, they don't have libraries in their homes. And the only access the kids might have is in their school. So if you're in a school that doesn't have a library that's functional, or if you have a teacher that doesn't have enough the sufficient number, the required amount of books in their classroom, or the teachers just can't, you know, they're spending their own money. I always say, I don't know many um, professions where you have to go out and source your own tools. You know, could you imagine if you went to work and you had to go out and buy your own stapler or, you know, papers to write on? Um, teachers are spending hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands yes. of dollars a year just to teach the kids that they're, they're serving. And that's across districts, regardless of uh, financial um, abilities. But um, for these teachers, they come to us on their days off. They are the most dedicated passionate individuals who are just trying to give their kids that head hands up. Um, so that's where we come in. We really try to level that playing field where access to books is concerned. And we try to make sure that the teachers have the sources that they need and that the kids have access to these books. Our main thing right now is to, to help build home libraries because the presence of books in a home is equal to, studies have shown it's equal to like two, two years of schooling, mm -hmm. especially for younger kids, kindergarten, you know, preschool through second grade. Um, and more importantly, if these kids aren't reading, functionally, you know, reading by the time they're in third grade, they're three times or, or two thirds more, excuse me, two thirds more likely to end up on welfare, in jail, or worse. And um, that's horrible for that child, but we're all paying for that. So if somebody's yeah. concerned about how does this affect me, you're paying for it. You're paying for it in your taxes. You're paying it for everything that you do. And, um, you know, I would hope that it would be that you're concerned about that child. But if you're not, you should be concerned about it because you're paying for it. And it's just going to get worse if we don't, especially with the pandemic. The pandemic created such deficits for all children across the board. Excuse me, but especially for those that are um, in under-resourced communities, because they didn't have the tools that they had at home. For for many of them, they were they didn't have two parents at home. Um, they, you know, they just didn't have the tools that they needed during the pandemic. So the studies that we're seeing are they're two to three years now behind what they were already already. So um, it's 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 a vicious cycle, and it's something that. I don't think that we even think about. If you have books in your house, I mean, I, I grew up, my mom read to me at a young age. I grew up with a love for books, with a respect for books. It's, it's not just mm -hmm. that, you know, you take the book out and you put it back. Um, it's, it's almost inconceivable to someone who grew up in, and we did not grow up in a rich neighborhood. I was, I was not wealthy. I was not uh, schooled in choat or... Mm -hmm. um, but for someone who grew up with books, to think about kids who can't get their hands on books is really tough. So maybe I go back again. Maybe I'll take, I'll give you Trinity uh, when I leave. Um, but when I go back again and I'm going like, this is actually something that we can do that doesn't cost us any money because we've already bought the books or gotten them as gifts, it and it, it really uh, makes an impact on the lives of other kids. It does. Um, your book that's sitting on your shelf, you know, I know a lot of people that are um, holding books for their grandchildren and things like that, and meanwhile they're sitting on a shelf for 20 years. Um, if you can afford it, just go out and buy them new ones mm -hmm. when they come out, you know, and, yeah. and give that book life um, while it's sitting in, on a shelf or in your garage or in your basement for 20 years. Um, if, if you feel really, really good. And the kids that get our books, we just had a free book fair yesterday, and the kids that get our books are super excited. I had one kid who, um, I think it was a dog man book, and he, um, he was telling us the story that he took the book out of the library in the school, but it's the end of the school year, and he was only up to page 114. So he wasn't going to be able to finish the book. And when he came into our free book fair for the summer reading, it was a summer reading book, um, he's like, I now I can finish it. Yeah. Like, you don't think of it. Our kids, you know, um, you know, just, well, we'll get you the book. Well, you know, we'll get you the book. But these kids, it's, Our kids it's, are spoiled. 
Yeah, there's, you know, it's, there's, there's definitely a, a difference, but you know, what I love is that many of these families that give us books, they come to our book bank with their children in tow. So those kids have gone through their own books and they've culled through what they don't mm -hmm. want anymore. And those parents, God bless them, are teaching their kids to give it, to pay it forward. And they're helping their peers. It could be a peer that's not even a mile away from where they live that's getting that book. And that's what we want people to understand is that you're helping your neighbors by cleaning out your, you know, your books. Again, you know, gently used um, books, we will get them in the hands of our neighbors. We take baby board to adult and primarily what we need is children's books. That's our primary need and that's really the bulk of what goes out. Mm -hmm. We do take adult books because we work with the homeless shelters. We work with the Mary Brennan Inn. They just created this wonderful library. They just reopened in a wonderful library so that they can. We want the kids to see their parents. You, you mentioned your, your house when you grow up. Your parents were reading. Everybody was reading myself as well. I'm the youngest of nine. We did not have money. I had hand me down everything. Mm -hmm. um, but my mother was always, my father worked two, three jobs, so I never saw him. But my mother was always reading and we would mirror what she was doing. And that's an important thing. So we want to make sure that the adult books get into the hands of adults so that they can mirror what the kids should be doing and create that cultural literacy within their house, within their home. Um, we work with the Brooklyn Public Library and we get, we call out special paper books for uh, Rikers Island. And the, the rate of recidivism is higher because the people who are in uh, jail don't know how to read. Most of the, there's a, there's a high percentage that don't know how to read. So if we can get them learning to how to read in jail, then they don't go at, come out and they have skills that they need to move forward in life. And then you reduce the rate of re recidivism in which mm -hmm. they're going back into things. So we try to find a place for every book. Um, our founder, Amy, has done a tremendous job in just trying to make sure that we're able to um, take these wonderful resources and get them in the hands of, of those that need them. I'm just gonna go back again. This is 2023. Mm -hmm. And we're in New York, and it's almost inconceivable that we don't have enough books or that there are people who can't read in New York City or in New York State in 2023. So what you guys are doing is, um, is beyond just handing out books. It's actually giving somebody a chance to, to change their lives. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't... <sighs> It's a happy thing. It's a good thing. It's, you know, it's a positive thing having a book, but this is a serious situation. One in four New Yorkers, it's actually one in four Americans cannot read. They are functionally illiterate. That's a huge number, 25%. Mm. And it actually sways a little higher, but we, we try to keep it within the one in four. Um, and it's impacting us all. If you can't read, you can't fill out an application. You can't get a driver's license. You can't even order off of a menu. Um, for many of them, we pay, I think it's um, $1.7 billion a year is lost in healthcare costs because people can't read their discharge papers because they can't read their medicine bottles. So this is a very serious subject. Well, it's light and airy and you get in hands in the, you know, books in the hands of children and we're trying to change the trajectory of their lives. Um, it's a very, it's, it's something that sh I'm shocked that when people don't want to cover the story, uh, I'm, sh I'm grateful for you allowing us to share what's going on. Um, while we cover one piece of it, which is the access to books. And I want to say people will like e-readers or, or computers, what have you. And they have a place, there's, there's a place for them as well. But babies through third, fourth, fifth grade, their, func their, their main purpose should be having physical books in their hands mm -hmm. and learning how to read. And that's why that's our, our main focus of what we do. But we do, t do hit every aspect of what we're doing. But it's a very serious subject and we're grateful for everybody that has joined in our mission. It takes a village. Um, listen, we don't exist without funding. Mm -hmm. uh, we tried that for seven years. Our founder, Amy, did it and uh, she did a tremendous job but she realized that she was building this wonderful bridge, but it had no pylons on it. Mm -hmm. So we were about ready to collapse when I had come in. Um, and I, I, you know, listen, I have the most 
utmost respect for her and she and I are like teams in what we're trying to do here. Um, but when I came in, I was able to create the infrastructure and start building the funds for what we needed to do um, and get the staffing. Because when I came in, we had one part-timer moving like 400,000 books a year. And that's the other thing I wanted to say. We've done 4 million books in 11 years. Um, our goal this year is 675,000 books distributed out which means that we'll probably have to take in about 800 to 900,000 books just to get the ones that are good called out. So um, it's a big lift. Uh, we definitely need funding to survive. Um, we don't own our own truck. And I, you say, probably thinking to yourself, well, how do I move 800,000 books? We have the most amazing um, partnership with the special needs community. Okay. We work with ACLD and, and AHRC and Life's Work mm -hmm. and DDI and uh, these incredible organizations that have the most generous, um, fun, talented volunteers who happen to have, you know, uh, part, be part of the IDD community. And they have the program without walls where they have vans mm -hmm. and in the vans, they can carry boxes. So they go around and they do all the pickups and the deliveries of our boxes for the most part. Um, and they won't go into the city, but, um, there could be 30 vans lined up at our book bank on any given day when we're opened. And uh, we would not exist if we didn't have those tremendous individuals working for them. And they love coming into us because they understand and want to give back mm -hmm. to their community. They want to have purpose in their life as well, and they deserve that. Oh, yes, and absolutely. so it's a wonderful, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that part of our, our um, partnerships because they are just, you know, from the heart, given to us and doing, you know, doing the heavy lifting, literally heavy lifting of getting the books to and from where we need them to go. So a big chunk of my career was spent with the IDD community. Oh, that's and, right. Uh, it's a community that I absolutely, you grew to, I grew to love. Oh. I, I just, you know, um, uh, not selling religion, but I'm a deacon in the Catholic church mm -hmm. and there's a parish in Whitestone that does a special needs mass once a month. And I leave my regular church, and I'm going up to, to Whitestone. Uh, it's it's wonderful. I mean, we've talked, we spent a lot of time talking about the feel good thing of giving books and getting books. Uh, you started to mention about the money and how we move the books. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what folks can do. And you know, it's we've still got some time left, but let's talk about what folks can do besides giving you books to help with the mission, because without a margin, there is no mission. I learned that in mm -hmm. grad school. I mm -hmm. mean, that's the first thing you learn in uh, strategic planning. Uh, so what can I do besides giving you books? Uh, and we, how? Yes, we are primarily a volunteer-run organization. We currently now only have two full-timers and three part-timers. So that's a lot of a lot of activity going on for five staff. We do have a couple of consultants that are helping us with technology and grant writing, um, but it's heavily on our five staff members. Um, so we are in desperate need of volunteers. We are open Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays in our book bank, and all of this is on our website. You can see how you can get involved on our website at bookfairies.org, um, but volunteers. So we need volunteers that do the book drives. Mm -hmm. um, kids have opened up their, families have opened up their homes to do book drives. Uh, corporations have joined us in book drives. And then we also need people to come into the book bank and help us sort through almost, you know, 800 to a million books a year. It's a lot. Um, so we're always looking for people for book drives, for, um, for the, uh, sorting and, and, um, checking for the books at the book bank, but there's also, um, ambassadors. We need ambassadors to share our mis mission. If you're shocked that one in four New Yorkers is illiterate and you want to get involved in this movement of trying to get books in the hands of children and adults who need them, then we need people to, we're constantly asked, do you want a table here? Do you want a table there? We don't have the infrastructure or the people to go and do that. Um, we hate to say no and people get upset at us, but you have to have road, you know, guardrails, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if we had people who just wanted to go out and speak on our behalf, we would train them and they could go out and they could speak anywhere from the Hamptons to the, to the Bronx on our behalf. Uh, we need drivers sometimes that will go outside of the geographic area that our special needs partners will do. 
And I will say that Amazon is a, is a proud partner of ours, and they will give us big lifts uh, for um, every other month, except for when it's the holidays. Um, they drove 60 to 100 boxes up to the Bronx for us so that the people from the Bronx didn't have to come to us on their day off. So um, people to do driving would be fantastic. Um, and then we need fundraisers, people who have maybe a unique idea and they want to just run a fundraiser on our behalf. That's mm -hmm. a way that they can get involved. Um, so it's really, and then donating your books. It's books, it's um, volunteerism, and it's funding. And I call it, it's a three-legged stool for us. And if any one of those three legs is wobbly, we're, we're off. We're wobbly. So we're, we're always trying to keep that balance between the influx of books. Um, we are looking to ascend to a million books a year distributed, which wow. is a big lift. Um, it's a big lift, uh, but we will do it. But we need larger space and we need funding to get into that larger space. Uh, we also need our own transportation because you can't control what you can't control. Right. So sometimes we'll deploy a special needs van out and they'll have an issue or whatever the case they forgot or whatever. So um, we have... Uh, we want to be able to control some of what we do with the transportation. We can't pick up books in Manhattan. We can't pick up books in, in the Bronx or, or Brooklyn. So if we had our own f form of transportation, we could do that. So we're looking. We actually have a generous sponsor who has offered to pay up to um, half of a van for us. So if we have anybody out there that wants to match that other half, we would love and welcome to be able to go out and actually buy that van. Um, and larger building space. We're looking for about 5,000 square feet of building space. That would be ideal for us to really be able to move to that million books. Sure. What are you in now? I, I, I visited once yeah. and you said people bring their kids along. I actually brought my dog along because mm -hmm. she was looking at me as I was leaving like, no, you're not leaving it. <laughs> um, but I, I, I saw your space, and it just looks like a huge garage. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I can see where where you would need more space. I didn't actually go in, but I sort of looked in, and I said, this is really small. Yeah, that was. if you looked in, you saw it. That was it. I always say, I'm going to take you on a tour, and when they come in, I go, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> it's 2,000 square feet, approximately. Um, we do have a storage unit in Freeport that we ha we hold um, books in, and then we also have Adventureland hold books for us, oh, holds really? books for us. Mm -hmm. uh, a wonderful organization called Mason Technologies holds books for us, because we just don't have enough space. So the goal is to really get everything under one roof. If I was running a business, you would say, well, that's very efficient, Eileen. What are you, uh, inefficient, what are you doing? So my goal has always been to just, uh, you know, very purposefully um, move us forward in what we've been doing. So we created infrastructure, we created a new website, we rebranded, we now have um, the ability for people to do everything systemically, which takes the stress off of, we, when I came, we were on 25 spreadsheets where, and emails was how we were controlling our, our wow. any. So we now, um, we got Salesforce, which was for free. And um, we have all the infrastructure that we need. So we really have that, you know, base, that foundation, and we're looking to grow on it. So 5,000 square feet is the answer. We've got 20 seconds to go. Okay. Hit them hard with the, the biggest 20 seconds that you've got. I would say that this is a major problem. You know, one in four New Yorkers is a big problem, and I think that you should get behind this movement because if you think it's not affecting you or impacting you, it is, and it will continue to do so. So give us your books, give us your time, give us your funding, and get involved. Thank you, Eileen. And uh, support the, the book fairies. Go to their website and uh, see what you can do to help not only them, but New Yorkers who do not have the access to books. Thank you again. This is John DiBiazzi. Have a great day. Eileen Minogue, and I'm the executive director for Book Fairies. One in four New Yorkers is considered functionally illiterate, and access to books is one of the barriers to achieving literacy. It's important that you get involved and help us to source, sort, and distribute books to our neighbors in need. Please consider donating your time, your books, and funding to help us move our mission forward.